In this video, we're going to discuss the reductions of ketones and aldehydes to alcohols affected using reducing agents. Now, first of all, let's note that treatment of a ketone or aldehyde with a reducing agent yields an alcohol, and an alcohol is at a lower oxidation level than a ketone or aldehyde, since this reaction is going to replace the CO double bond with a CO single bond and a new CH bond. And kind of the classic, if you're coming from organic chemistry one, the classic reducing agent is hydrogen gas and a metal catalyst. So something like H2 and palladium or platinum metal. We may reason that, okay, if I can reduce a CC double bond to a CC single bond, an alkene to an alkane, using H2 and a metal catalyst, I should be able to do the same with a CO double bond, right? And the answer is yes, but it's not as easy because the CO double bond is quite a bit stronger than a CC double bond. So this is rarely used in practice, but when we do treat a ketone or aldehyde with H2 and for example, palladium, the elements of H2 add across the CO double bond. This requires a high pr partial pressure of H2 in order to get this reaction to go. So it's rarely used in practice, particularly because we have these second and third options, which are much easier to set up operationally and work just as well, if not better. So the second reagent here is sodium borohydride, and it's what's known as a complex metal hydride. It contains a metal hydride anion, BH4 minus, that's the borohydride anion, together with a sodium plus counter ion. So it's a complex metal hydride. Before we dig into this reaction, let's take a look at sodium borohydride's structure. So the Na plus cation is pretty much a spectator. It's not doing really any business in this reaction except following negative charges around. But the borohydride anion is much more interesting. This has a central boron linked with four bonds to four hydrogens and negative formal charge on the boron atom. Now, boron is a metal oid, so it's not super happy with negative charge. And we can think about an alternative resonance form of this structure in which we break that BH bond toward the more electronegative atom, which is actually hydrogen in this structure, putting the negative charge on the hydrogen atom as opposed to boron. And this shows that the hydrogens and the borohydride anion are nucleophilic. They're electron rich. They act a lot like H minus. They just find themselves inside the borohydride anion. And so in essence, what's happening here, and we'll look at the detailed mechanism on the next slide, but in essence, what's happening is the nucleophilic addition of hydride to the carbonyl carbon. So this hydrogen highlighted in red is this hydrogen that ends up linked to the carbonyl carbon in the alcohol product. The hydroxyl hydrogen is more like an H plus, right? You can imagine if hydride added here, we'd end up with an O minus, that O minus gets protonated to form the neutral alcohol product. And with NaBH4, that proton could come, for example, from ethanol, which is commonly used as a solvent here. So sodium borohydride is great for reducing ketones and alcohols, uh, ketones and aldehydes to alcohols, and it's particularly good because it's selective for ketones and aldehydes. The third option, lithium aluminum hydride, is a ravenous complex metal hydride, much more reactive than NaBH4 because we replaced the metalloid boron with the full-blown metal aluminum. And now aluminum really can't stand having a negative formal charge. And so this alternative resonance form with H- is arguably more important in the case of uh, lithium aluminum hydride or LAH, as you'll hear me refer to it, than it is in the borohydride case. But the idea here is very much the same. This is a source of nucleophilic hydrogen or hydride. That hydride adds to the carbonyl carbon. That's where this red hydrogen comes from. And then a subsequent workup step in the case of LAH involving just treatment with water is what protonates the alkoxide, the O minus, to put the hydrogen on the hydroxyl group right here. So Notice, this is a reduction. The products are actually the same in all three of these cases. The difference is, in the first case, we're using H2 as the reducing agent, and in the second cases, we're, uh, second and third cases, we're using a complex metal hydride, either sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride, followed by an aqueous workup, in that case, to protonate the alkoxide. Now let's touch on the reaction mechanism involved in these complex metal hydride reductions of ketones and aldehydes 
to alcohols. So we can represent the complex metal hydride using this kind of general structure. Here I've used a lithium plus counter ion, but sodium plus will work just as well. And it's grayed out because this is pretty much just going to follow negative charges around. It's a spectator ion throughout the mechanism. This same mechanism applies whether we're thinking about the borohydride anion, in which case the metal is boron, or the aluminum hydride anion, in which case the metal is aluminum. The same basic mechanism is going to apply. And it all hinges on the nucleophilic nature of this hydrogen right here. It wants to take that pair of electrons and give that pair of electrons to something where it's more stable. And it can do this in the presence of a carbonyl compound, ketone or aldehyde, through a nucleophilic addition to the carbonyl carbon of the ketone or aldehyde. And this elementary step is absolutely critical and we'll dig into it in great detail in an upcoming unit. This produces an alkoxide anion, which you see right here, and that alkoxide anion will generally sit there in lithium aluminum hydride reductions until we add water. In the case of sodium borohydride with an alcohol solvent, this could pluck a proton off of that ethanolic uh, or alcoholic solvent. It's going to pluck a proton off of some acid. That might be H2O, that might be HOR, its exact identity really doesn't matter that much to us. And this gets us to the neutral alcohol product. So we've got a two-step sequence here, nucleophilic addition to the carbonyl carbon, followed by proton transfer to that alkoxide oxygen that's generated. And as a byproduct here, we get the lithium or sodium salt of the conjugate base of the acid. All right, fantastic. One thing we should note about this nucleophilic addition step is that this could establish a stereocenter at the former carbonyl carbon. In particular, if these two groups linked to the carbonyl carbon are different from each other and, are, and neither is hydrogen, this is going to generate a stereocenter. So this 2-butanone substrate is an example of this, where addition of a nucleophile is going to establish a stereocenter and convert this achiral reactant, achiral because it's got a plane of symmetry as shown here, into chiral products. And specifically, the product we get depends on which side that nucleophilic hydride adds to. If it adds to the left-hand side, if you like, we get this product on the left with the nucleophile here. And if we look at the sense of rotation of, for example, O to nuke to ethyl, it goes like this. If the nucleophile adds to the right-hand side, we get this structure on the right, and if we look at the sense of rotation O to nucleophile to ethyl here, it's going in the opposite direction, counterclockwise here, clockwise here. We've got two different configurations at this newly created stereocenter, and these are enantiomers. And so they'll be produced in 50% yield each, equal yields, because these molecules are enantiomers. So what we'll end up with is a racemic mixture of enantiomers when a chiral alcohol is produced from an achiral ketone or aldehyde. With carboxylic acids and carboxylic acid derivatives in the presence of lithium aluminum hydride, we actually get double reduction, so to speak, all the way down to the alcohol oxidation level. So notice here, for example, that when we start with a carboxylic acid or with an ester, we end up with the alcohol in both cases. And in the case of an ester, we end up both with the alcohol of the acyl group and the alcohol of the alkoxy group here. We have methanol derived from the alkoxy group and this alcohol derived from the acyl portion of the ester. And we know a double reduction is occurring here because two new hydrogens have been added to the former carbonyl carbon. And in the first case, when a carboxylic acid is used, ultimately water is going to be a byproduct here. That's where that disappearing oxygen has disappeared too. This gets incorporated into water, ultimately. So let's talk about the mechanism of this, because it's going to serve as another example of nucleophilic addition to the carbonyl group with a little bit of a twist. So first of all, thinking about carboxylic acids, these are quite acidic. And so under these strongly basic conditions where a hydride-like species is around, that carbon, carboxylic acid will be deprotonated completely to a carboxylate, which is this species right here. Now this doesn't look that electrophilic because it's negatively charged, but aluminum hydride is so ravenously nucleophilic that H- can still add to the carbonyl carbon of a carboxylate. This gives a dianion with a structure like this where I've gone ahead and coordinated the ALH3 to that second negatively charged oxygen. This can eliminate 
that oxygen to form a species that is actually negative two charge with O, Al, and three Hs. And really importantly for our purposes, on the organic side, this is going to produce an aldehyde intermediate. It's right there. Now we already know from the previous slides that aldehydes are reduced to alcohols by lithium aluminum hydride. And so what happens now is our standard mechanism of reduction of an aldehyde to an alcohol under these conditions. Nucleophilic addition of hydride to the carbonyl carbon. This forms an alkoxide intermediate. And on workup, that alkoxide is protonated to give the neutral alcohol. So we add water in that second step to protonate the alkoxide. Now, I did want to mention briefly what happens to that oxygen um, that departed with aluminum in the beta elimination step. On workup, on treatment with water, this is going to get converted into aluminum hydroxide salts and water, ultimately. And all of that gets washed away with the aqueous phase, and our alcohol stays in the organic phase, and we just isolate that. And so these byproducts, you don't need to worry about too much, but it's worth noting that workup is used to separate those byproducts from the alcohol product we want. Finally, I do want to mention that esters work similarly, but in the case of an ester, rather than this monstrosity in the beta elimination step, we'll just have an alkoxide, and that alkoxide ultimately is going to get protonated upon acidic workup of the reaction mixture to give the alkoxy alcohol, which sometimes we care about, but often we don't. If it's something like methanol or ethanol, we'll tend to discard that and keep the more precious acyl-derived alcohol on for the next step.